the colonial affair appears there on the outside and colonial affair and Julie Crone riding for her life now as they come down toward the final furlong here in the Belmont. Wild Gale is there kissing Chris with a late run on the extreme outside and they're coming down to the wire and colonial affair. Julie Crone, the first woman to win the Belmont. She wins by two. All right, welcome back to Racing Rundown. Uh, wherever you may be, however you may be listening, I'm your host, Jack Sargent. We are live today with Julie Crone. iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, not on iHeartRadio. They do not like us. Uh, we don't like them either. But uh, just a quick program note uh, for anyone who is wondering. We were originally scheduled to have the president of Horse Racing Wrongs on the show today. He canceled on me, and that will not be rescheduled. I decided to uh, not have him on the show. I Basically, you guys were not in favor of that, so I did what the viewers wanted, and so we're not going to have him on, but an interview that's going to be a lot less hostile. Uh, we have Julie Crone, the all-time winningest female jockey, first jockey to win a Triple Crown, female jockey to win a Triple Crown, and a Breeders' Cup race. Julie, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. So now, I know uh, we got a lot to get to, but uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is you are running a jockey camp for kids age 12 to 17 up in upstate New York this year. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, it's a camp for the kids between 12 and 17, like you said. They are going to have scholarship sponsorship. It's at a farm called Long Shadows Farm in Cambridge, New York. And the racing community, all the way from everybody to owners, to trainers, to racetrack management, to people on Twitter that are betters, they've all just really come behind the jockeys. They've all really supported this, and they've all donated for the jockeys, uh, for the junior jockey campers, and the horses that we're using in the farm. And I... I uh, I'm very pleased to announce that I almost, well, if everybody goes through with their pledge, I'll have all the campers sponsored, and um, I'm just really excited because I've always wanted to teach, um, even though sometimes when I was riding, I gave some riding lessons then, <laughs> um, now I want to, uh, it really hits a chord with me because I really, that's the true, true thing that I think I'm going to really find my niche in doing. Um, it's weird because I've been away from racing for a while, but now this is a fun way to get back into the racing. And on top of that, we're using all uh, retired thoroughbreds. That is very great to hear. Again, if you are interested in any more information about that, you can find that on, like Julie said, Twitter, anywhere. I have retweeted several things about that. If you are for some Wait, reason... In the, in the, the, the dot .com for it is juniorjockeycamp.com. Or longshadowsfarms.com. Um, yeah, juniorjockeycamp.com or longshadowsfarm.org. Yeah, that's what it is. Or longshadowsfarm.org. And if you are interested in uh, checking that out, you can check out those link links. You can also find the links to it on my Twitter. If you, for some reason, are not following Twitter, you should. Uh, my Twitter's. <laughs> exactly. My Twitter's Rundown Racing. You can find Julie Crone on Twitter at I Love Horses. That's E Y E Love Horses on Twitter. Uh, let's get started with the actual interview. Uh, the age old question that I have to ask everyone that comes on How'd you get started in horse racing? <laughs> well, I never, I never remember not having horses in my life. I wasn't really, um, I was raised, my mother was just obsessed with horses. Like it was the only thing she ever did horses and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> but good thing the horses were the best part of it. Um, she ended up passing away in her early 50s from cancer. But up until then, she instilled in me some pretty intense horsemanship training. Um, I was able to uh, teach horses to do about 22 circus tricks by the time I was 12 or 13 years old. And that's like the circus tricks you see when the horses are at liberty. They kneel and lay down and bow and all that. So by the time I got to the racetrack and I could use reins, uh, it was pretty easy. So my mom had really given me a real intense horse psychology education when I was younger. Um, then I did 4-H and I did uh, horse shows. I did all kinds of stuff. I did jumping and 
trail riding, and there was never a time when horses just weren't like the hugest part of my life. And then this certain jockey named Steve Cawson won the Triple Crown that year, and I was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I, I loved racing, thoroughbred racing, and never went back from there. And uh, it was really quite fun at the Santa Anita. Two weekends ago, I got to uh, hang out with Steve at the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund uh, event. And it was just really a treat for me to meet his wife and talk to him in a relaxed setting and stuff. And he's every bit the every bit of my uh, my fan crushing I had on him was pretty funny. So yeah, so I've always always been around horses. And then then Steve Cawson brought me to the track. Uh, you started racing in 1981. Do you remember your first win? Oh, of course I do, Lord Farkle. Well. Actually, I rode at the fair track for the summer times when I was 15, so I had, I had ridden about 80 races and I got to win about, oh my gosh, I almost won 30 races, 35 races at the fair track, but that was very different, it wasn't fair mutual wagering, it was uh, thoroughbreds, Appaloosas, Arabians, and quarter horses, and then I went to the thoroughbred track, and my mom forged my birth certificate so I could gallop at Churchill Downs. And then I went back to school until I was 16, and then I came back, and Lord Fargo was my first official winner um, at a thoroughbred racetrack at Tampa Bay Downs. And, a little fun fact, Tom Durkin called my first winner. Ooh, the legend Tom Durkin. Uh, so, did you ever envision yourself getting to the heights that you would eventually reach in your career uh, in those early days? Um, well, of course I did. You don't, nobody, nobody that's young and ambitious goes up against something thinking, oh, I just want to be mediocre. I mean, maybe there are people, but I've never met them. So, yeah, I did, I did have dreams. Um, that being said, there's a big difference between knowing that you're going to be successful and having it actually happen. <laughs> it's kind of like it becomes surreal almost, you know, you're kind of like, well, I can't believe this is happening to me kind of a moment. But, I, yeah, I didn't get into racing wanting to be mediocre, that's for sure. Now, I forgot to actually forgot to ask Chantel Sutherland this. I'm not the biggest fan of this question, but I was meaning to ask her this, and I want to ask you. Was there anything different about you, you being one of the girls on the track, or was it just, I love what I'm doing and I'm just doing it, I don't really care about any of that kind of stuff? Um, well, okay, so you're asking me a, an interesting question, because it would be... I've never been a boy jockey, so I don't know. You know, maybe they have their own set of uh, mental mental and physical barriers. The obvious barrier is a gender-related one, which is like, you know, if you... The racing game was once kind of like... Uh, well, Kathy Kuffner is a good reminder of that. She was at the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund at Santa Anita, the event, and... The year I was on the front page of my local newspaper at the Berrien County Youth Fair, and the fair, the fair newspaper read, Little Julie Crone, Tough to Beat and Trail Class, Returning Champion. That was the year, 1969, when Kathy Kuffner went to court to make sure that us girl jockeys could ride. Um, unfortunately, she got injured on a horse qualifying for the Olympics that year. Uh, she's a silver Olympic medal winner. Um, but the argument was they were like, oh, well, you can't ride. You'll, you'd get too excited or be affected by, you know, the race and everything. And if anybody's ever taken a look at what Olympic riders used to do in the, in the early 70s and late 60s, you would know that Kathy Kuffner was more than capable of handling a racehorse on the, in, the, in a field of 12. That being said, uh, yeah, there were moments when there's gender-related obstacles. I mean, that's silly not to think that there would be if just years before a woman had to go to court so we could ride racehorses. Um, but there were also times when I think it actually worked to my advantage. Like sometimes, uh, so I, you know, worked way more against me than it did to my advantage. But it's also all in your perception. You know, you gotta, if you're going to do something, you're not going to use excuses no matter what it is, even if it's gender related or uh, you know, the color of your skin or, like, whatever. you got to get in there and you got to try your very best. And, and every day if, like, 20 people told me, no, 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 I don't, my owner doesn't want a girl jockey, I would just go back out the next morning that much more determined. And and then 
I really, really honestly know for sure that my horsemanship, um, because my mom was so thorough in teaching me everything about horses, and I, I'm so good at horse psychology and working and getting a horse to do what I want them to do, that once I even got the slightest chance, even with a horse that had the longer odds and stuff, I would have a knack for making them run really well. And that's the bottom line in racing. You have to win, and you have to get seconds and thirds when the horse should have been last, and then people notice you. So, yeah, sure, the gender thing was an obstacle, and it was a challenge, but once again, it, you have to decide how you're going to handle it, you know, and not take no for an answer. Uh, you got your first stakes win in 1983 in a grade three at Pimlico and the now defunct Woodlawn Stakes. Uh, what, what what did that mean to win a stakes race so early in your career? <laughs> well, that was pretty cool. I'm not sure, but I think the horse got in really late. Um, it was Descaro's Rib, and it was for Mr. Dutro. Uh, and it, it was pretty exciting, especially the chance that the horse was maybe going to go to the Breeders' Cup. Um, I mean, the Breeders' Cup, sorry. The Pimlico, the, the Preakness. So it was kind of fun, you know, right after the race because it's a... It's kind of like a prep race for uh, the previous movie, and then we knew he wasn't going to go, but for me, it was really exciting. So it was just pure downright, like, wow. Like, I was just so excited. I was so young. I knew the horse was going to run well. I've ridden him before. I've ridden him in breezes, and Mr. Dutro was really, really confident in him, um, and really, he really knew how to prep a horse, Mr. Dickie Dutro. Oh, what a trainer he was. It was the most amazing thing to be able to ride for him. Um... So, yeah, the horse got in really light. I was pretty sure he was going to win. And um, I was just i was just a, a kid really happy that, you know, like on a Christmas morning that something really good happened in my career. You were, uh, in 1988, you were one of the five jockeys that got to ride a really, really good racehorse, 49er. Uh, you rode him in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, unfortunately, he did not win that. And I think him not winning ultimately cost him the Eclipse Award that year. But... Uh, how good was 49er, and what kind of a thrill was it to ride in the Breeders' Cup Classic on him for uh, the ultra horseman, Woody Stevens? Well, that was really that was really a special thing, especially winning on him at Monmouth and feeling his quality and how gorgeous he was, and a uh, big, wide neck, and his mane just laid perfectly down, and he had perfect proportions, and just had a beautiful way of carrying himself, and... Um, that was so fun to ride him at Monmouth and then such a thrill to ride him in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, it's kind of interesting that you said that because um, if you go back to some of those older clips or maybe some of those newspapers, uh, or the back then it wasn't like, you know, you didn't catch every single thing Jockey said or did. But uh, I had a spot around the turn where, because it was getting a little bit dark, um, and I was on the rail around the turn and the cameras were going off, the flash cameras were going off. And 49er, he didn't, he didn't shy, but he, like, jumped, and then he slapped his foot at the camera like he was, like, fighting something, you know, like, and it kind of cost him a little bit of a, his momentum that day, uh, and it was kind of a really, uh, I always wonder about, like, when I look back, and then when I saw the horse shy this, this year in the derby, I was kind of like, oh, that was around the same spot, although it was for completely different reasons, um, it just made me recall back to that day when I think 49er could have run a little bit better had he not been uh, a little affected by that flash. Um, and yeah, you know, you just do your very best with horses. And, and that was a shame that he didn't get an Eclipse Award that year, but it was a big thrill for me to ride him and be part of, the, uh, be part of that with Woody, that's for sure. How great of a trainer was Woody Stevens? Um, well, I didn't get to ride that much for him. You know, I had just moved over from the Meadowlands. At that time, I wasn't in that whole uh, big, gigantic, like that one first group. And I was in the next group with Aunt Lee and the, the other guys. Like, So I didn't really get to ride for him that much as some of the older jockeys did. But I have a, uh, he was such a nice guy. I went to the Churchill Downs. I wrote somebody for him at Churchill Downs. I forget who it was now, but um, well, I went out of town for him once in a while. Because that's how you start your career, you know, like the other jockeys stay at home and ride the bigger stake races, and then you take the horses and go out of town. And um, he, he, he lent me 100 bucks that day. I, I lost my wallet somehow at the airport on my way to the track. And I was like, oh, my God, Woody, I, I need money to get back home. I, and back then you could travel without your ID, which was hysterical. <laughs> um, and I um, he lent me $100, and then... We always joked about it because I went to pay him back and he wouldn't take it back. And then he was like, I always want to tell people you owe me a hundred bucks. 
<laughs> it was the funniest thing. And um, my agent, the day 49er was open, uh, I think um, Lafitte and some other jockeys, they were involved in the the jockey, uh, they were protesting. So I forget what they were doing. For They wouldn't ride for some reason, and I don't remember what it was, which is really weird because normally I remember those things. But anyway, Lafitte uh, wasn't going to ride, and... Um, Oh, no, there was another horse open after I paid attention to that. And my, I, stopped, I stopped my agent at Belmont, and I said, Stop, there's Woody Stevens. I want to talk to him. And he goes, You're just going to get out of the car and talk to Woody Stevens. And I was like, Yeah, how do you get to know a trainer, you know? And we laughed because my agent and I were so opposite. Um, I was always kind of like a little bit of a go-getter, and he was kind of like, uh, he did the other stuff. We made a good team, but that was funny. when I, I just walked right up to Woody, and then that's how I got the horse to mount on uh I think 49er at Monmouth or some other horse that I want to race for him. And then I ended up winning a couple grade ones for them, which was really fun. I know uh, another reason why that mount was open is uh, McCarran uh, had Ali Sheba. And obviously, Chris was going to take Ali Sheba. But 49er, I think one of the more underrated horses that there have been. Uh, one of the uh, other champions that you got the chance to ride for uh, in 1992 was Sprinter Rubiano uh, for... Centennial Farms, who we'll get to Colonial Affair in a minute, but what did those people at Centennial Farms and uh, Scotty, Scotty Schuhofer mean for your career? Oh my gosh, that was so, so fun to go to New York and Centennial, oh my gosh, still to this day, Scotty, um, I think about, I mean, I had a couple really good horses for him, Tactical Advantage and Rubiano, and what a fun, fun horse that was, and Speaking of fun, that was the first race I think I won for Scotty on this long shot horse. I think it was like 30 to 1, and her name was Fun, Fun, Fun. And I had been at the barn breeding some horses, and Scotty never even flinched, you know, that I was a girl jockey. He never even asked one question. He put me on tough horses, and, you know, and Jose and I, Jose was riding most of the barn at the time, and we got along really well, and I was just coming across the river from the Meadowlands, you know, trying to get my foot in the door there at Belmont and yeah he was Centennial Farm was monumental in my success uh and still to this day I stay friends with them it's fun to follow them on Twitter they're coming up to a huge weekend with Candy Graham and Mijos and Preservationist at the uh for this weekend coming up and so I'm really looking forward to cheering for them and yeah Rubiano was a very special horse and Centennial and Scotty definitely, along with Chief and, and yeah, Alan Jerkins and Billy Ma, you know, those guys rode me early on before anybody else did. And I have a funny story about John Veach. Um, I used to visit John Veach in the morning and Mac Miller. Mac Miller was pretty tied to Jerry Bailey at the time, but I'd always say hi to everybody. Uh, but I was, um, I was, I was like, I'd walk down with him every morning and I'd tell John Veach story, like story, funny stories and you know, jokes and everything. And one day he said, Julia, I really like talking to you, but I'll never ride you on a horse. And I was like, well, why is that, Mr. Veach? And he's like, well, because you're a girl. You're a girl jockey, and I don't ride girl jockeys. And I was like, okay. So I, I never rubbed it in his face, but not even three months later, I rode I rode a, I rode a grade one winner for him. Um, oh, my God, what's her name? I just forgot her name. Uh, Plenty of Grace. Uh and to put on those Darby silks and stand in the mirror and like, oh my gosh, and ride for John Veach at Belmont and win that, it was like, oh my God, we were, I think it was the Flower Bowl or one of those grade one stakes, we were all across the track. And another horse, she got in super late and so I could do the weight and then John knew she could beat the horses if she got a good trip, so I got to ride her. Um, and Billy Mott did that with Gaby Gailey and, and um Alan Jerkins did that with a couple horses, and Tommy Skiffington early on, and, and Shug McGee, I rode tons of horses for him in the winter at Aqueduct that got in light um, that I wouldn't have no normally ridden, so that was kind of how my career got started, but Centennial really gave me an opportunity, be, you know, before other people were kind of like, you know, oh, she's a girl jockey or whatever, French, Scotty never even flinched. Now, obviously, uh, one horse that I'm sure every person knows you for is Colonial Affair. How much did he mean for your career? Um, well, that's a classic win. And my hero, Steve Coffin, was, was, uh, he was, he was doing the races that day. He was commentating. So that was pretty exciting. 
Um, and it was really sad that Mike Force broke down. That was just a tremendous weight and sadness for everybody. Uh, but for me, it was a happy day, and it did a lot. It did a lot for my career, and it definitely jumped up, you know, the next notch with the qualification of having a classic win. In that race, you were coming around the turn. It looked like uh, Colonial Affair had a lot of horse left. At what point did you think you were going to win the Belmont Stakes? Well, I kept looking back for Mike. Um, I'm pretty, and uh, his like, I kept looking back for them the whole time because he had he was the horse to beat. And when I checked the third time, I was kind of like, well, I guess he's not coming. So I had a lot of horse that day. Um, I just didn't want to move too early because I had ridden Colonial Affair less than perfect in. I think a race or two before that, and I was really aware of the fact that he would, uh, could or would pull up. So you were consciously thinking about uh, not wanting to move too early, but also not wanting to uh, leave too much ground, or move too late, per se. Well, no, I wasn't, no, he was kind of, I had the horses in sight that were in front of me, so I was just waiting for the horse to come from behind me. And for Mike, and Mike and I to turn for home for, together. So I kind of thought I had the horses in sight in front of me. You never thought uh, coming down the stretch that you were going to get beat once you realized that Mike was uh, not coming? I kept thinking he was going to be there the whole entire time. <laughs> but he never ended up catching me, so yeah. And like I said, that was a, kind of a sad race and a happy race at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh Fast forwarding two years later, that very same uh, Belmont Stakes race, uh, 1995, you were riding a highly touted son of uh, risen star, star standard in the Belmont Hail Stakes, and uh, my friend Gary Stevens uh, came Mandy at you with Rogers Thunder Gulch. Did you think that uh, you had a chance Mandy to outlast okay, Gary and Thunder Gulch in that race? Or? Oh my God, Thunder Gulch, was, uh, he was running, he was such a good horse, and I thought maybe, but oh, my horse was getting out so bad and pulling on the left rein the entire race. It was really frustrating and hard to ride him. Fleet Street and every time I let him go forward a little bit, he would drift out. So I was either having to hold him in and, you know, and not let him run because I couldn't let him run and bolt out at the same time, which I ended up kind of mixing it together a little bit. Uh, but no, Thunder Gulch was a pretty good horse. And my horse was not at his best that day. He was dealing with something that was making him... You know, hang on the one rein and get out right there. Still only four and a half lengths off the leaders. Looks like now, uh, you also had a very tight second in the 1995 Breeders' Cup sprint. Uh, you were on a horse, I believe the name was uh, Mr. Th Thank You. I had had that pulled up and I lost it. Uh, what? Kind of, he, he kind of seemed like in that race to come up to Desert Stormer, and Desert Stormer just took the challenge and went away with it. How good did he run on that day, despite uh, ending up finishing second? Oh, uh, he was such a, he was a funny little horse. He was so quirky. He was a little dark livered chestnut. He was always so naughty and strange. He always had these things he was doing, flipping his head around, and always had these, like, just like, oh, he's his own worst enemy emotionally, you know, and uh, he was funny, but oh, when he could make, if he got a day where he didn't make any mistakes, he was a really good little sprinter, and he's got some really nice babies, you know, to prove it, so I think, I'm, I'm always interested to talk to people of the babies, and they're like, I'm like, oh, how challenging are they mentally, and they're like, oh, they are a little quirky, but, you know, he, I really got along with him well, and, you know, going back to my mom's training when I was younger and learning really how to read horses and get inside their heads and um you know and it's not so much making them do things horses as it is getting inside their heads and guiding them to make the right choices as opposed to the wrong choices so but when you could get Mr. Greeley to make all the right choices what a neat little sprinter he was he was a cool little horse now, uh, you got close to the end of your career. In 1999, to when you announced your first retirement, uh, you went out uh, with a three three winners on that card at Lone Star Park, and your mom was there. What was that final day of your career like, of your first retirement at Lone Star? Uh, well, by then I had had uh, what people call PTSD pretty bad, and I think it had compromised my riding a little bit. Um, 
I think at that point, if I would have had, like, one more spill during that, like, it, it might have looked like I was riding well and stuff, but I was just probably three-quarters my real self, you know? Um, and I think it was, I was emotionally triggered um, more so towards, like, when my mom's cancer started to get really bad and I had to, like, be with her more. And, like, she only lasted, um, oh, my God, not even seven months after I stopped riding. Um and she, you know, I had to help her get into hospice and all that. So I think my my PTSD and my, like, thinking that something bad was going to happen when I was racing was triggered a little bit by her vulnerability and then going through a huge life change of losing my mother to cancer at such a young age and stuff like that. So I was just a little less myself than I'd ever been before. Um, but what a special day that was to have three winners and to have my mom there and... um one of the interesting images I have is, in my mind, when the horses went out on the racetrack that day for the last race, uh, um, I had purposely said to myself, when the bugler blew his horn, I was going to look behind me that day. Um, I'm not sure if I had an outside post or not, but if I remember correctly, I think I did. And that was one of the reasons. I was like, look, I'm last out of the paddock. I'm going to look behind me when I leave the paddock and see what it looks like. And walking behind me was... Jay Hovde and my mother, um, and my mother was in a, in a wheelchair at the time, and she kind of like said, oh, I want to walk, so she got out of the wheelchair, and I looked back, and Jay Hovde and my mom were there walking together, and it was kind of an interesting image for me, because um, years later, I would end up marrying Jay Hovde, <laughs> so it was kind of a funny thing. Now, you retired initially, but you didn't stay far away from horse racing. Was that a... Uh, I don't know exactly what the word would be for, but was that a top priority to stay in horse racing, even though you weren't necessarily going to be riding? Um, well, yeah, you know, you spend your whole life doing something, being in the sport and learning the people and, but, but I will tell you when I moved to California, I had a huge year that year. I, I, I got a divorce. I moved across the country from the New York, New Jersey area. I changed my job. My mother died of cancer. Like, whew, man, that was a big year for me. So, yeah, it was kind of cool to be able to work for TVG for a while till I got fired, which made me sad. But that's okay. It was like, um, they fired a lot of people that year. And um, then I moved, and then I worked over at Hollywood Park, which was so fun being a commentator. And, um, I did a few spots for TVG once in a while afterwards, and I would still love to go back with them. That was really sad getting fired by them. That would be a fun job to have again. Uh, but, yeah, that was really fun working and, and commentating and stuff. But I wasn't that good at it. I think I'm a little better at it now because I was too fresh from racing and I was, like, a little competitive still. Um, and so, and probably not as um, convivial and, and, and uh, politically correct in some of my things, which I, I guess that's a way, better way to be sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, I... Uh, I like to stay near the races and the horses and stuff like that, but it was really different for me because I had to, like, I had to get the book, the actual book from, like, uh, Hollywood Park and Santa Anita and everything to learn all the trainers and everything because I had spent so much of my time on the East Coast. And, I mean, obviously I knew all the big guys, but I had to learn all the smaller trainers and the jockeys, like, jockeys I hadn't ridden with that were all on the West Coast a lot. Uh, so that was really fun, opening my mind and broadening my horizons with uh, new people and new friends in California. Um, and then, then I kept commentating, and I kept watching the races, and I, I decided one day, after watching the races, I, I was like, Jay and I were married, and it had been a while, and I was like, hey, Jay, I think I can ride with these guys. Um, I think I could win some races. Um, I, I want to try to be a jockey. I want to I come out of retirement and be a jockey again. And so Jay and I had had some talks about it, and I hooked up with Mandela, and I so I made a deal kind of with Mandela and, and Jay that I would gallop horses for like a year um, and see how I felt in a year because I didn't want to be like hasty and then have it be not work out. So I galloped horses for the year, and then I got every time, every time, every day and every month I went by, I got more and more anxious to ride and like excited about it, and so... It turned out pretty doggone good. I won two million dollar races and was leading money winner at Del Mar, 
won all the three main stakes, got a Breeders' Cup, won the Pacific Classic. I would say that was a pretty good out-of-retirement race, you know, off of, off of coming off of a big layoff. <laughs> I've always heard the statement that uh, this sport for some reason, puts a magnet in people, and as much as you try to get away from it, it always ends up drawing you back. Would you agree with that statement? <laughs> like somebody implants stuff, something in our brain? <laughs> sure. <laughs> there is something about it. And, you know, like, I really love horses. Um, like, I just really love horses, and, and, you know, and racing obviously has a lot of horses. And so, and then I love talking to I love talking theory and I love talking about uh mastering techniques like being a jockey and stuff and that's why the junior jockey camp is going to be so fun because I get to share all those things um and yeah definitely something about racing that brings you back in that's for sure and it never gets out of your system um and for me it used to be the competition and and to get inside of a horse's head, you know, if one jockey, I loved it when a jockey would be like, oh, the horse, he always gives me a hard time, he does this, and I'd love, I'd go up to the trainer, I'd be like, oh, wow, can I try it? Because I would think right away I'd have a way to get to, in the horse's mind and stuff, you know? So I was competitive in a way that I wanted to uh, master all the horse's minds, kind of like. Um, and so... That's what always drew me back and you know, the, the idea that you could make each horse so happy that they would run the most fast for you as they do for anybody else. So, yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty addicted to that. You mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago that uh, you had a big year in 2003 and you came back and won a Breeders' Cup. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but did you ever think throughout your career that uh, the, that Breeders' Cup win was never going to come? Um, no, I didn't. Once again, I don't, I don't approach things like that. You know, you, I can't be a successful athlete with that kind of an attitude. <laughs> you have to have like a, a climb, you know, a, a, an accomplishing forward attitude. Uh, and that's always what I had. And, and then see too, like, if you look at it from the aspect of just being a person watching a sport, I was looking at the aspect of, I never looked at anything else. I never picked my head up from half bridal to development. Like every breeze she did, every you know, every time she put on a pound or two, every time she got braver or smarter as a baby, every time she got more confident in the starting gate, every time she went a longer distance, like my head was so wrapped up and so deep in, into her development and her life. I wasn't, I don't look at it as a big picture. I look at it as little increments of accomplishments that make her invaluable as an athlete and powerful and unbeatable because of the way we were developing her. So you, you, other people on the outside might look at it different, but when you're on the inside with the horse, it's like you have your head, your head's down and you're not looking up and you know what your horse is capable of. And that's kind of more what I end up doing. I end up kind of really getting into what's going on and I and I positive image stuff a lot like I already saw her beating all those horses like different ways you know from handicapping and then from the way of her development and if one beat another one and if we beat one going a shorter distance and then she went longer and obviously she was big so like all those things were uh for me take the attention away from the possibility of failure like so I'm so focused on development and accomplishment I don't really think about that how rewarding is that to see a, a horse like Half Bridled, who was a two-year-old you had been with for her entire racing career? How rewarding is that to see her progress and show the talent that she had and eventually cap off that uh, two-year-old year in a Breeders' Cup win? Oh, my God. To go with her from a little bit, and not little, she was gigantic, in the one hole at Del Mar to, like, winning the, it, that was, it's just the most complete uh it fills in all the range of emotions from love to like just just blow your mind with affection and and oh my gosh just the most beautiful fun feeling ever and to feel them grow as athletes you know and be like a little blink blink eye blinking little young horse gate what's the starting gate to like you know going in the starting gate with her at the breeders cup and i kept telling her because she'd drawn the inside hole so many times 
like I would walk in the gate and I would tell her, as even in the post break, okay, look, and I mean tell her that what I mean by that is all the silent communication a rider has with a horse, you know, telling her to re- be really relaxed when she gets into the gate, to take her time because it's going to be a long time for babies to load, and, and then she's got to get out of there, you know, but don't break too hard because, you know, like, so her, all her other races, she was on inside posts, and I was always telling her to be calm, stand a long time, be calm, stand a long time. And this time she was walking up to the starting gate, and I'm like, okay, girl, you can't, you got to get in there, and we're, we're going to be 1,001, 1,002, out of there. Like, I was like, and you've got to break better than you've ever broken your whole life. You know, I'm like, you have to, like, you have to really break hard this day. And, um, like, in her little ears when I watched the video, as I was, like, pinching her kind of with my legs and then, but then steadying her with my hands to tell her, you know, not too much. It has to be just the right amount. You have to be a little over ready, but not too ready. Um, and she just read all my signals because we'd been together for so long and we'd been through all those things. And so, oh, my gosh, it's, it's just like your head and heart just explode with, with the accomplishment and the sharing and, and, I love sharing stuff with horses, and so to share something like that with a horse just was one of the most fun, beautiful things ever. It was so cool to watch her grow up. Uh, you also uh, mentioned you won the Pacific Classic in, uh, also in 2003. You rode Candy Ride in that race. Candy Ride's legacy has been cemented as a stallion producing some great horses, but he was undefeated on the racetrack. How good was Candy Ride? Oh, my God, he had the highest cruising speed. Oh, my gosh, and Medaglia Dioro, like, might be tough a mile and an eighth, but if he wanted to go around again, Candy Ride was like, let's do it. And um, it was, he's the best horse I ever rode, sat on. Like, when Ron McAnally said, don't let Medaglia Dioro get a free trip, and I want, you know, you can have him have, you can let Candy Ride have a tiny little breather around the first turn, but then I want you to go to his boot and, like, make him beat you and I was kind of like oh my gosh I, those are terrible directions right in my mind but oh my god once we broke out of the gate because I only got to breathe candy ride once I didn't get to ride him in his other races um after he broke out of the starting gate I was just like oh my god this horse has wings he was he was so fast and so competitive and so easy to ride and oh what a dream boat he was now, uh, Candy Ride, uh, through an oversight, was not nominated for the Breeders' Cup in 2003, and he ultimately did not run. How well do you think he would have run had he been given the opportunity to run at that stage? Oh, my gosh, those distance were, were his favorite. You know, the mile and a quarter and a mile, like, further the, further the better. But he could do anything. But, yeah, he would have been pretty competitive. Uh, you were also in a match race that year with uh, Patrick Valenzuela, uh, what was that like to be in that match race with him? A, a match race that it looked like you were going to win that, and then it just seemed like your horse just completely ran out of gas. Uh, sure. That's it. I'm just so sad about that. I, I'll let you know when I get over that and I can talk about it. I'm just, it makes me nauseous just thinking about it, okay? <sighs> Sorry. I just, like, so, oh, that was the worst day of my life. That was terrible. That That's perfectly fine. Uh, now, you decided to retire again in 2004, but that wouldn't be the last time you would be on a racetrack. You rode in a uh, race in 2008 with uh, seven other jockeys, among them Gary Stevens, Pat Day, Chris McCarron, and Jerry Bailey. Uh, what was that like to be there with all those guys? All of you had been retired for at least a few years. Uh, to just come back, what was that like? Yeah, that was pretty special. That was, uh, that was, and actually part of the question beeped out for some reason. So I only heard part of the question at the end. What was the beginning part? Uh, just talking about how you were in that race with all those guys. Uh, what was? How much fun was that to be with them? You guys had all been retired for. Oh, a- in Texas, the, the the race in Texas, when the the phone beeped out for some reason, I couldn't hear the first part of your question. The two th- the race in two thousand eight where you ran with uh, Gary, Jerry, uh, Pat Day, Chris McCarron, uh, Angel Cordero. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that is that is. When you look around and you see Lafitte and the post parade and all those guys, that is really, really special and super and fun. And, and then, and didn't Sandy, did Sandy Holly win that race? Uh, I don't actually, have never actually been able to see who won that race because uh, it wasn't documented. But I know that all you guys were in that. I, I just know that Gary didn't win that race. Gary and you didn't win that race. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, can actually... 
I could it's check if Santa Claus was on there. That's for sure. That was really fun too at the permanently disabled jockeys thing at Santa Anita. There was like every Hall of Famer was there almost. It was awesome. And that would have been great, great to have been there. Uh, if Gary had been able to make our original interview date, uh, I was going to plug that. Uh, all the people that were gonna going to be there. Uh, once again, she's Julie Crone. If you're if you did not hear at the beginning, and if you're interested in on that, uh, she's doing a junior jockey camp up in New Upstate New York in later this month. If it's you just, want any, it's, it's just twenty minutes north of Saratoga, it's in Cambridge, New York, at the Long Shadows Charitable Foundation Farm in Cambridge, New York, and it's juniorjockeycamp.com, um, and you can go to the website, and it'll take you to the Long Shadows website and. It's all on scholarship. The racing community has donated generously and sponsored all the kids. We all we're all riding off the track, retired thoroughbreds. It's a, it's amazing for the whole community. It helps the horses. It helps the, the people in the area. It brings more racing fans and younger. You educate some younger people and horses and let them be exercise riders and jockeys and maybe even starting gate people and just bring people that are young and love horses into the game and teach them the right way and expose them to all the things that it takes to be a jockey. JuniorJockeyCamp.com And you can also find links to that on our Twitters. Uh, once again, I'll plug that again. Uh, she's on Twitter at I Love Horses EYE and I'm on horses or on Twitter at Rundown Racing. The last question I'm going to ask you, Julian, this is the question that I ask all my guests. If you could go back in time to any moment in the history of horse racing and be there to experience it firsthand, what moment would you choose? Steve Coffin's a fern. How would you not pick that up? I'm fan crush Steve Coffin, okay? I love that guy. His career and everything that he stood for, his his sureness and his just his youth and, and oh my God, on that big red horse and winning the Triple Crown and the style he had and oh my God, I'm just... I, I like his wife was cracking up. She was like, "Oh my God! Now I have to go home and live with him after we did the after we hung out for a while." And uh, and yeah, it would definitely be affirmed. That's for sure. The odds were one to twenty on Julie picking that moment. By the way, exactly. when I got home, Jay and I had had some old articles. I I pulled some old articles out from literally when Steve won like five in a day at Aqueduct when he had an apprenticeship and stuff. And when I got home, I sent him pictures. He was laughing. He was like, "Wow, that was a long time ago." All right, Julie. Julie, thank you for being on the show once again. Uh, episode number 22 will be out tomorrow. Uh, we got Vic Stauffer on Friday, uh, former Hollywood Park track announcer, and uh, that should be the end of this insane week that I've had on the show. Uh, once again, thank you for coming on, Julie. Yeah, my pleasure.